today we will discuss the fifth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. The title of the fifth chapter is uh, Karma Yoga Action in Krishna Consciousness. In the beginning of this chapter, Arjuna asks a question from Krishna. Just like in the third chapter, Arjuna was confused. Similarly, in the fifth chapter, in the beginning, Arjuna is again confused. So what is Arjuna's confusion? In the third chapter, Krishna explained that a person situated in spiritual knowledge need not do any prescribed duties. In the fourth chapter, Krishna explains that all sacrifices end in spiritual knowledge. But at the end of the fourth chapter, Krishna advised Arjuna to fight. Now Arjuna is confused about Krishna's stressing the importance of work in devotion and inaction in knowledge. Inaction in knowledge means one who is situated in spiritual understanding need not do any duties. So therefore, Arjuna is now asking Krishna, tell me definitively which of the two paths is more beneficial for me? This is what Arjuna is asking. Arjuna is confused because for him work and renunciation appear to be opposite. To clear up Arjuna's confusion, Krishna explains in this fifth chapter about devotional work in full knowledge is without any reaction. Devotional work in full knowledge is without any reaction. And it is therefore the same as renunciation of work, which is also aimed at becoming free from all reactions. But Krishna says, of these two paths, the path of devotional work and the path of renunciation of work, of the two paths, devotional work is better. Now why devotional work is better, I will tell a little later. Before that, Krishna explains what is the consciousness of a person who works in devotion. Such a person does not have any likes or dislikes for the results of his activities. He is always renounced as regards the result of his activity. He is free from all dualities like like and dislike. And in this way he easily overcomes bondage and is completely liberated. Now these two paths, the path of devotional work and the path of renunciation of work, they have got a common goal. What is the common goal? Common goal is Vishnu. How do we understand this? Uh, it is said that the aim of renunciation of work is to find the soul of existence. And the soul of existence is Vishnu. 
therefore those who renounce work find the soul of existence vishnu and then in perfect knowledge they engage in the service of vishnu what about those who do devotional work they directly render service to vishnu therefore vishnu is the common aim or goal of both these processes or both these paths but ignorant people they don't understand that both these paths have got a common goal they say that the aim of devotional work is different from the aim of renunciation of work but those who are actually having proper understanding those who are actually learned they say that whoever applies himself well to one of these paths can achieve the results of both now why is devotional work better than renunciation of work <clears throat> that is because simply by renouncing all activities without engaging in devotional service one cannot be happy the path of renunciation of work is difficult and filled with distress on the other hand the path of devotional work is easy and is filled with happiness see the contrast devotional work is easy and one can do it happily renunciation of work is difficult and also it is distressful therefore krishna says the path of devotional work is better than the path of renunciation of work now the superiority of the path of devotional work is established by krishna when he describes the characteristics of a person who is engaged in this devotional work he says one who works in devotion is a pure soul and he controls his mind and senses he is dear to everyone and everyone is dear to him though always working such a person is never entangled in any reactions further krishna says a person working in devotion although engaged in sense activities always knows within himself that actually he is doing nothing at all because while he is working he always knows that only his senses are engaged with their objects and he is aloof from them such a person does not want any enjoyment from his senses that is because his senses are engaged in different activities only for the satisfaction of krishna that is the spirit of devotional work such a person performs his duty without attachment and surrenders the result of his work to krishna now this theme of surrendering the result of one's work to krishna is there throughout the bhagavad gita even in the last chapter in the 18th chapter also krishna will describe this one should surrender the results of his work to krishna because if one works in this way then he is unaffected by any sinful reaction as the lotus leaf though remaining in water is untouched by water this is a special characteristic of a lotus leaf if you have seen water cannot remain on a lotus leaf therefore even if it is in within water it is actually never getting wet similarly a person 
who performs devotional work even though engaged apparently in ordinary activities he is never entangled those who work in devotion they act with their body mind intelligence and senses without any attachment only for the purpose of purification in fact the purpose of performing yoga practice is actually purification of our self material existence means we are contaminated and one who wants liberation from material bondage must purify his existence <clears throat> the steadily devoted person attains unadulterated peace because he offers the result of all activities to krishna whereas a person who does not offer us results to krishna but is greedy for the results of his work for himself he becomes entangled and he can never be peaceful next krishna describes three doers of all activities that generally people perform in this world listen carefully now generally a person who works performs any action he thinks he is the only doer of all actions that he does he thinks i am the only doer but krishna says no there are three doers involved in any activity of this world who are the three doers the first doer is the person who desires to do something the second doer is the super soul the super soul is sitting in everybody's heart so that super soul who is the supreme lord himself krishna he is the second doer the third doer is material nature prakriti material nature now the reality is that a person can only desire to do something some activity after that what happens vishnu as the super soul or krishna as the super soul he has to sanction that activity he seated in the heart of every person let's say i desire to lift my hand let me give an example now when i desire to lift my hand krishna in my heart has to sanction that yes you may lift your hand and then what happens after i desire krishna sanctions material nature actually does the real work of lifting the hand but due to false ego ahankara i think that i am lifting my hand whenever i desire to lift my hand i lift my hand but you all know supposing a person has got a paralytic stroke when he desires to lift his hand can he lift his hand he cannot so that proves that he is not really in control of his hand or for the matter the whole body so krishna explains this body 
is under the control of material nature. This body is made up of the elements of material nature. It is controlled by material nature and material nature is working exactly according to the directions of Krishna as super soul. Therefore, we should remember any activity has got three doers. I can only desire to do something. After I desire, it is dependent on the sanction of the activity to be carried out by material nature. The sanctioner is Krishna as the super soul. Then the actual action is carried out by material nature. So you should always remember three doers. So what is the implication of that understanding? So Krishna explains, if a person actually is detached from his body, then whatever the activities of the body, whatever the result of the actions of the body, the actions and reactions of the body, a detached person is completely unaffected. Whereas a person who is in ignorance has to suffer the reactions of the body. So Krishna says, one should be detached from the body and the bodily actions and reactions. That way, you don't have to suffer due to this uh, uh, body. Next, Krishna describes how do people who perform devotional work progress on this path to get complete liberation. This is the definite path, the best path for attaining complete liberation from material bondage. But how does a person progress on the path of liberation? That he explains. He says, when one's intelligence, mind, faith and refuge are all fixed in Krishna, or, in other words, when one is fully Krishna conscious, such a person becomes cleansed of all contamination within the heart through attaining complete perfect knowledge. Then, such a person makes steady progress on the path of liberation. <clears throat> By virtue of True knowledge, such a person who is progressing on the devotional path, he sees with equal vision a learned Brahmana, a cow, an elephant, a dog and a dog eater. What does this mean? This means that within every type of living being, there is the actual spirit soul. And the person who is having this true knowledge, he sees the spirit soul, he does not see the body. That means he does not recognize the differences in the body, external body. He understands that every living being is ultimately spirit soul. And the Supreme Lord, Krishna, is seated in the heart of every living being 
as Paramatma, equally without any distinction. It is not that Krishna is seated as Paramatma only in the heart of humans. No. He is seated in the heart of humans, he is seated in the heart of animals, he is seated in the heart of insects. Every living being, Krishna is seated as Paramatma, Super Soul in their heart. So this is recognized by a person who is situated in true knowledge, who is having proper understanding. Such equanimity of mind is a sign of self-realization. And because of this, such a person is already liberated. He will not take his birth again in this world, but will go to the spiritual world. This is guaranteed. Further symptoms of the self-realized person are given by Krishna. He does not rejoice upon achieving something pleasant, nor does he lament upon obtaining something unpleasant. See, our material existence is such that sometimes there is some pleasant result of some work and sometimes there is some unpleasant result. So a person who is self-realized does not bother about good or bad results, pleasant or unpleasant experiences, he does not care. He does not mistake the body to be the real self. He un fully understands that I am not the body, I am soul, I am spirit soul. He knows the complete science of God. He perfectly understands who is God. That means he never makes the mistake of thinking that the spirit soul is the same as God. Always perfect understanding means I am not God. Neither I can become God. I am always a tiny part of God. God is, a God or Krishna is always the complete whole. And I am always eternally a very, very, very tiny, insignificant part of Krishna as spirit soul. So, this relationship between every person and Krishna is that the relationship is like that between part and whole. The part never can become the whole. Part can never become the whole. So, therefore, this understanding, perfect understanding of every person being a tiny, insignificant part of the Supreme Lord Krishna, who is the complete whole. This understanding is there for a person who is having perfect knowledge and consequently is self-realized. Such a liberated person is not attracted to sense pleasure. Generally we know people, ordinary people, they always want some pleasure from the senses. They want to enjoy eating something very palatable. Or they want to see something beautiful. Or they want to smell something very fragrant. Or they want to hear something very pleasing for their ears. Some praise or some nice music or some nice sweet words, but a liberated person knows that this is not real, 
happiness this is not wor worthwhile hmm? uh, why this is not worthwhile uh, will be explained in a later verse by krishna but here he just mentions this that a liberated person is not attracted to sense pleasure but is always in trance and he enjoys the pleasure within in this way the self realized person enjoys unlimited happiness this is in contrast to the happiness one gets from sense pleasure which is very very little it is momentary it is flickering hmm? uh, whereas the pleasure within is unlimited a self realized person does not take part in the sources of misery which are due to contact with the sense objects see sense pleasure is basically senses coming in contact with the sense objects such pleasures sense pleasures have a beginning and an end and therefore the wise man never takes delight in them this is the reason why krishna explains a self realized soul does not take uh, sense pleasure very seriously it is very very little it's meager and it is just a temporary flickering momentary sensation that's all that's why you see people always seeking happiness in this world they are seeking happiness i want happiness i want happiness i want happiness even if you already have had happiness it will not last now what is the nature of this pleasure within it is unlimited it is unending it's so attractive actually this kind of pleasure within <clears throat> further krishna says before giving up this present body such a self realized soul is able to tolerate the urges of the senses and check the force of desire and anger in this way he is well situated and is happy in this world we know when somebody becomes angry it is a disturbance to his peace or somebody has lot of desires he is always working for satisfying his desires so he is not always successful uh, sometimes people do become frustrated or they are always agitated in the mind whereas a self realized soul self realized person is peaceful he is not any more interested in satisfying his desires own desires his happiness is within and he is always active within he is beyond the dualities that arise from doubts because of perfect knowledge no more any doubts his mind is engaged within and he is always busy working for the welfare of all living beings he is completely free from all sins see the nature of his activities he works for the welfare of all living beings that equality of vision makes him work for the welfare of everyone he is self disciplined and he constantly endeavors for perfection thus he is assured of liberation in the very near future 
next Krishna describes briefly the process of Ashtanga Yoga to achieve liberation. This process of Ashtanga Yoga will be described in detail in the next chapter, the sixth chapter. Here he briefly uh, just mentions it, very very briefly. Shutting out all the external sense objects, keeping the eyes and vision concentrated between the two eyebrows, suspending the inward and outward breaths within the nostrils, controlling the mind, senses and intelligence. The spiritualist who aims at liberation becomes free from desire, fear and anger. Being situated always in the state, he is certainly liberated. You get an idea? It's so difficult, this process of Ashtanga Yoga. Krishna will describe this in detail in the next chapter. He's just ending this chapter by briefly describing this process. Krishna concludes this chapter by describing how one can attain perfect peace from all material miseries. This is the last verse of this chapter. Krishna says one should know three things to attain this perfect peace. What are the three things? First one is that Krishna is the ultimate beneficiary of all sacrifices and austerities. <clears throat> In every sacrifice, even though some sacrifice may be done for some devata, Indra Yajna, Chandi Homa, so many different types of sacrifices are there in the Vedas. But this is one secret that Krishna is mentioning here. Ultimately, Krishna is the Yajneshwara. Krishna is the Lord of all sacrifices. Because it is He only who awards the results of all sacrifices. This was explained in the fourth chapter. Krishna only awards the results. Even the devatas to whom some sacrifice may be offered, they are dependent on Krishna's sanction. They are not independent. Final sanction is by Krishna. So, Krishna is the ultimate beneficiary of all sacrifices and even all austerities. If somebody does some austerity, for whatever purpose, that austerity can be successful only if Krishna awards the result. Without Krishna awarding the result, nobody can be successful in doing any penance or austerity. Not possible. Second fact about Krishna, one should know, is that Krishna is the supreme lord of all planets and all devatas. Actually, in this whole universe, there are millions of planets. Each planet has got a particular devata who is controlling the affairs of that planet. But we should know that every devata is in that position only when such a devata is appointed by Krishna as the controller of that planet, as the lord of that planet. 
as the overseer of all activities of the planet. Surya Deva, Chandra Deva, Vayu Deva, Agni Deva, Varuna, Indra, every Devata is actually appointed by Krishna. Krishna is above all the Devatas. Therefore, Krishna is the Supreme Lord of all planets and all Devatas. Second fact. The third fact is, Krishna is the benefactor and the well-wisher of every living being in this entire universe. Krishna is the topmost well-wisher. So one who knows Krishna in this way, these three facts about Krishna, such a person can attain perfect peace. Only such a person can get perfect peace. Actually, this is described by Srila Prabhupada as the perfect peace formula. People are striving so hard for attaining peace in this world, individually and collectively. But peace cannot be obtained if one does not have this knowledge about Krishna, the Supreme Lord. This is the only way to attain perfect peace and there is no other way. I will stop here. Thank you. Hare Krishna.